Hi all and welcome to some science and math skills that are going to help you succeed in labs um, in honors environmental science. The first thing that we want to talk about is the difference between exact and inexact numbers. Now this might seem really odd because you think well aren't all numbers exact but actually they're not. And so the types of numbers that we consider to be exact numbers are numbers in which we name almost like name them like objects. So if you look at the examples there, a dozen eggs, a hundred cents in a dollar, three children on a chair. When you look at all of these, you can see that we could physically count the objects that are there. And I bet that if you took a moment and thought, you could think of other examples of things that you could count. Think about going to the grocery store or the farmer's market or, or Lowe's even. What do you find there that you could count? Those are exact numbers. Now, when we talk about inexact numbers, this is any kind of number that we take a measurement of. This would be using a ruler or a graduated cylinder or a balance or a scale. All of those things are not perfect. You know that when you go to Amazon, you can look up all kinds of quality of these items, higher priced, lower priced, all of that. And that may or may not equate to a better reading item. So when it says quality of scale, it means physically, how well was the item made? When the item was manufactured, how exactly distanced are the lines on the physical item? Quality of the pointer. This would mean, probably best described, if you stepped on one of those old scales and the old scale needle went up, can you tell exactly how much you weigh? Do you weigh 100 pounds? Do you weigh 101 pounds? Do you weigh 100.1 pounds? How specific is that pointer? How small is it? Can you tell to the tenth of the pound? Calibration. How well was the scale maintained? In other words, do you have little brothers that come running up and jump on the scale? Maybe they broke one of the little legs on it. Um, maybe you know, when you've been using the graduated cylinder, some of the students have, you know, rubbed off some of the markings, that would mean that the calibration on that would be lower. And then the last one I love to call human error. Is the person reading the item really able to do it? Do they know how to read from the bottom of a meniscus, for example, or are they going to make an error? Significant figures. The reason that significant figures are so important is because they define the accuracy and, and precision of a particular measurement. They basically tell us how accurate a measurement is. If you went into Lowe's or Home Depot and you asked them to measure and cut a piece of wood to the nearest inch, they wouldn't have any problem doing that for you. They would have machines that would be able to cut that. If you went in and told them you want it to the hundredth of the inch, they would be like, we just don't have the machinery. We can't do this for you. We're sorry. We can't be that precise. And that's why precision is so incredibly important. We're going to talk in a little bit about how we actually decide um, how many digits are significant and how we report them. We're also going to figure out um, how to add and subtract and round to the, the correct number of significant figures. Accuracy versus precision. Okay, accuracy is how closely do numbers agree to the correct value. So let's pretend that we have an actual measurement. Let's go out on a limb and say that we magically get the kilogram. There is an actual kilogram out there in the world that is the official kilogram. So it says exactly how much mass is in a kilogram. When you measure an, another mass on a different uh, balance, how close is that to the actual measurement that you would get of the actual kilogram? That's accuracy. Precision. How close does one measurement come to another? In other words, when you have, let's say you have a group of students reading and every single student reads the graduated cylinder and privately writes down their answer and they all put down 3.1 milliliters. That is very precise. If, on the other hand, another group goes over and they write down 30.1, their answers are all also very close together. That is also precision. 
but let's pretend that the actual amount of water in that graduated cylinder was 3.2. Both sets of measurements are very precise, but both sets of measurements are not very accurate. The first groups would be more accurate than the second. So I want you to think for a moment. Is there a way in which you could have high precision but low accuracy? And what would that look like? The best way to imagine that is a dartboard. Let's take them from letter A all the way through letter D. Letter A shows low accuracy and low precision. Look at the position on the board. Remember that we're pretending that this is a really simple game of darts, that all we're trying to do is hit the bullseye. And so this would be low accuracy, low precision. Over here, you would have low accuracy and high precision. Do you notice how they're all together, but they're nowhere near the center of the dartboard? This would be high accuracy and high precision. They're quite close together and they're quite close to where we want them to be. Then we would have, I'm sorry, high accuracy, low precision, excuse me. This is high accuracy, high precision. They're all practically on top of one another and they are exactly where we want them to be. Significant figures. When we do significant figures, there are some rules. Sometimes you'll also hear me call them sig figs. It's just the shortened word for significant figures. When we do this, we write down all of the digits that are precisely known plus one last digit that's an estimation. So if you could imagine having a graduated cylinder and you read the graduated cylinder, and let's pretend that this is one of the ones that you probably used from last year that counts to um, a whole milliliter. Let's just pretend it only counts to it. So you, you bend down, you look at it, and you notice that the water is above the three millimeter mark, but under halfway to four. So maybe you guess that it's 3.3. You've given a precise digit, you know it is above the three, and an imprecise digit, you have guessed that it's approximately 0.3 additional milliliters. So you would report the answer as 3.3 plus or minus. Non-zero digits are always significant. If you look at the uh, problem down there, any number in this number is significant. So if we count them, this one would have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine significant figures. All final zeros after the decimal point are significant. So in other words, here we would have one, two, three, four, five significant digits in 12.740. But we would only have one, two, three significant digits in 0 0.0420. Four. Zeros between two other significant digits are always significant. In 10.0, three sig figs. In 2004, four sig figs. In 6.000, four sig figs. Zeros used only for spacing uh, the decimal point are not significant. I know that this is gonna seem really odd, but you have to imagine them like placeholders. This one is only 100 because we've put these two placeholders behind it. If you want these digits to be significant, all you have to do is put a decimal point behind it and all of a sudden, all of these digits would be significant. All of these numbers are not significant. Why? Because they're just positioning this 233 in its correct location. So none of these are significant. This one would have three significant figures. Sorry about that. Always put a zero in front of a decimal. The reason that we like to put a zero in front of a decimal is that it makes the, the decimal point more obvious to the reader. I understand that this decimal is not, or this zero, excuse me, is not significant. I understand that these zeros, or this zero here is not significant. 
and these ones are not significant because they're placeholders, but it makes where this decimal point appears better. There's a really simple rule to be able to count significant figures. So all of that stuff is important. It gives you the, the rules, but there's a really simple way to always get it correct. It's called the Atlantic Pacific rule. If the decimal is present, count from the Pacific. That means count left to right. If the decimal is absent, count from the Atlantic. That means count from right to left. We're going to practice these with the Atlantic Pacific rule, and we're going to talk about um, how we round. So when I'm looking at this number, 37.45, I notice that the decimal is present. And so I'm going to count the number of significant figures, one, two, three, four. Now, if I wanted there to only be three significant figures, because that's how precise my measurement tool is, I would take this back end and I would round it to 37.5. This one, the decimal is also present, so I count from the left. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. But I don't want seven significant figures. I'd like there to be five, or maybe I'd like there to be three. So this is how I would round out the, this number to comply with how specific I'm allowed to be. Remember, all of the digits are certain about, and then the last one is always going to be a rounded guess. This is the only one where there's not a decimal point on the screen. So over here, if uh, there's no decimal, so I'm going to count from the Atlantic side, and there are two significant figures here. Whereas because the decimal is present, I count from the Pacific side, and there are one, two, three, four. If I wanted two significant figures, then I would round uh, to 37. Why? Because remember, I only want two significant figures, one, two, and I round off the next digit. If I wanted four significant figures, one, two, three, four, I would round off this, this digit and I would have 123.7. Adding and subtracting in significant figures is also easy. You follow all of the same rules. Basically, you line your numbers up. You add your numbers. Then you go back to the problem. The rule says that you are going to do it to the least number of decimal places. Well, how many decimals are there here? One, two, three. But there are only two here. So when you have two decimal places, that's what your significant figures need to be in. So it's correctly rounded to 15.02. Multiplying is slightly different. You set your problem up just like you would any other math problem. Then you need to know that what you're going to do is you need to count the number of significant figures and you're going to round to the lower number because we always take the one that is the least precise and round to that. So we count one, two, three, four, five in 10.482. One, two, three in 3.51. After the math is done, we're going to count to the three place, one, two, three, that's 36.7, except the nine is higher than five, so we round to 